are good. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone. We are so excited that you are here to join us today for this um, important and um, relevant conversation. Uh, this is October 1st. We are officially beginning uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month as a nation. And here at STIC, we are opening up the conversation and the connection with one another about these issues through our virtual keynote speaker, Rosalia Rivera. Um, so welcome to Telling Our Stories to Create Change. And John, you can go ahead and um, forward to the next slide. So um, just to begin by introducing myself, my name is Cindy Brunig, and I work at STIC um, through an amazing grant um, through the US Department of Justice Office of Violence Against Women, uh, known as OVW. So I work for the OVW Campus Program Grant. And John, you can actually um, go to the next slide. <laughs> So, um, so my grant basically and the work that I do um, gives Stick the charge to build strong campus and community partnerships in order to carry out culturally relevant programming with the ultimate goal of strengthening both our prevention efforts as well as our response efforts um, in order to um, better serve folks who are experiencing um, dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. So really looking to strengthen prevention so less people have to go through these experiences, um, as well as strengthen our trauma-informed support. So when a student, faculty, or staff may be experiencing one of these issues, we know how to respond um, and support and make a difference um, in how that person can get help um, for healing and wholeness and moving um, forward with their lives. So, um, so that is our grant. We work on domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. And this event, um, Telling Our Stories to Create Change, is but one of many prevention efforts that we do on campus and with the community. So I just want to say um, a couple of important notes. Um, first of all, I want to thank our partners, both campus and community partners. Um, we are uh, providing this event today with the generous support of um, Title IX, in collaboration with the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Hispanic Association of Higher Education here on campus, um, as well as the YWCA of Western Massachusetts. And we're gonna be hearing from someone from the Y in just a moment. Um, so thank you to our partners. And um, just uh, really important to know this webinar is being recorded. It will be available for view after today. And um, Another important thing I want to speak to uh, before we move forward is that because of the nature of the issues that we're going to be talking about today, um, there is likely that those of us who are a part of this event today have been impacted, um, whether it's domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and or um, childhood sexual abuse. These are issues that are so widespread that uh, many of us joining today may have been impacted by them at one point in our lives. And so we want you all to know um, as participants that we are here for you and that we have ways that you can find support, whether it is in the next hour, if something comes up and you want to connect with someone um, for support, we have someone here to support you as well as after the event in the days and weeks to come. And so uh, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague from the YWCA, Mariah, and she's going to speak to some of those resources. Hi everyone, my name is Mariah Cabrera and I work as a sexual assault counselor for the YWCA of Western Massachusetts. Um, and we really want you all to know that STIC has a free and confidential YWCA campus advocate. Her name is Sarah Mikesell and she's really awesome, kind, friendly, and supportive. She offers counseling, support, advocacy to students and faculty and staff who have been impacted by domestic or dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. And you can contact Sarah by calling 413 732-3121 extension 308 or email her at advocate at stick.edu and if you need help outside of business hours our organization the YWCA does have a 24-hour sexual and domestic violence hotline available and that's at 413-733-7100 and we also want to encourage you to take a screenshot of the slide if you would like to save those numbers but they're also going to be in the chat below so you can go back to them later and if anyone does need support within this next hour, immediately right now, you can call me during this event. And my number is 413-238-1698. As I said, my name is Mariah and Cindy will actually be adding that to the chat right now. 
And John, could you forward the slide that we had to just another little, um, yes. So this is the slide that, thank you so much, Mariah. Um, this is the slide that Mariah was referring to in terms of um, those numbers to take a screenshot of. So I'm just gonna pause for a moment for folks to be able to take a screenshot of the um, Sarah's information, how to contact our YWCA campus advocate, as well as the 24 hour hotline. On this screen as well, you will find a link to the STIC website where extensive resources are um, able to be found for whether it's free and confidential resources and or um, for folks who may be seeking to report um, issues that they've experienced. We have a comprehensive list of resources and the key takeaway from that list is that it describes how to access them within the context of COVID-19. All of these resources still being available, um, but sometimes in um, a different format than they would have been in person. So please see that website um, for more information and support. And in a moment, I'm gonna add everything that Mariah just said to the chat as well. I've put her contact for anyone needing support during this presentation. And I'm gonna add Sarah and the 24 hour hotline into the chat in just a moment. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to um, Benetta Lightfoot, uh, my colleague from the Office of Multicultural Affairs. Hello everyone, my name is Benetta Lightfoot and I am the Operations Manager for the Office of Multicultural Affairs here at STCC. And Multicultural Affairs provides culturally specific educational programming, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and a student and community engagement. Multicultural Affairs supports the college's commitment to building a diverse and is inclusive climate on campus while creating an environment that is both safe and welcoming for all students to be successful. I am also a very proud sponsor of today's event. So just to give you um, an idea of what the format is like for today, our event will consist of a 45 minute keynote address followed by 15 minutes of Q&A from the audience. Participants will be muted for the duration of the event. Please please post any question you have for the speaker in the chat. The event hosts will be monitoring the chat and will gather questions for the Q&A. Again, this event will be recorded and available for viewing for those who cannot attend live. I will now pass it to my colleague, Jennifer, from the Hispanic Association of Higher Education. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Wallace Johnson, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Hispanic Association of Higher Education here at STCC. And we're also happy to be co-sponsoring co this event. And as a representative of the Hispanic Association, this event speaks to the mission of the Hispanic Association and also to our rich relationships with our co-sponsors who have a commitment to these necessary topics and initiatives. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce our keynote speaker today. Um, Rosalia Rivera is a passionate consent educator, sexual literacy advocate, speaker, change agent, and survivor turned thriver. She is the host of About Consent, a podcast for survivors and those who support survivors. Rosalia is also the founder of Consent Parenting, an online platform for survivor parents to learn how to protect their families from abuse. Her mission is threefold. Number one, to help parents and caregivers to empower the children in their lives through consent education and eradicate child sexual abuse. Number two, to help childhood sexual trauma survivors find their voice, rediscover their power, and reclaim their innate sexual divinity. To dis and number three, to dismantle shame around sexuality through education and awareness. So I'd like to welcome Rosalia and I'm going to hand it over to her. Thank you. I'm a 42 year old Latinx mother of three living in a rural town in Northern Canada, very happily married with my husband on our homestead farm, living my best life. You would probably never guess that when I was 20 years old, I dressed like a dominatrix for work. Now, let me clarify. I wasn't working as a dominatrix. I just dressed like one for my bartending job. And shortly, I will explain why I'm sharing this with you. So just put that in your back pocket for a bit. I'm a consent educator. 
But the concept of consent was completely foreign to me 25 years ago when I was 17. Back then, I thought that I knew everything. I mean, you've probably been there as a teen. You know what I mean. Um, I had life figured out. And my mom, on the other hand, knew nothing. Uh, back then, she just seemed like a nagging old lady uh, who just really wanted to control my life. And I was not having it. Um, I was very rebellious growing up because I grew up in a very strict Catholic Latinx home. And if she told me not to wear a short skirt and red lipstick, when I was at home, I listened. But when I got to school, I changed into my outfit. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but because of the culture that I grew up in in the 90s, which hasn't gotten much better really today, but that combined with my former uh, experiences of childhood sexual abuse, I was unconsciously conditioned to connect my sexual desirability with my worth. So when I was 17, I met a guy at a college bar uh, one night that I had snuck off with my friend who had graduated high school the year before um, and she was going to a local college. And I met this guy at a bar with her and I thought that he was, he was it, like he was just the cutest. And I thought that he thought the same of me. And I couldn't even believe it that a college guy could like a high school girl. So he asked me on a date, I gave him my number, and then I realized I had to figure out how to go on this date with him because I knew that my mom, being the strict Catholic Latina mom, was not going to let me go. Uh, so I had to figure out a way how to get on this date, and you know, I figured it out. Um, but let me rewind a minute. Just to give you a little bit of background, I was never allowed to date. I was you know, not allowed to even look at guys or let guys look at me. I wasn't a virgin at the time, but I also was very inexperienced. And I had a lot of shame because according to my mom, a girl's virginity was like the sum of her worth. I mean, at least that was the underlying message that I was getting from her and also culture. But really, I knew practically nothing about sex. And my own abuse as a child was still blocked. My memories actually hadn't surfaced yet. They didn't, wouldn't surface until I was in my 30s. But I really didn't know anything about sex. And going on a date didn't mean having sex to me. Like, that wasn't what I equated. So the reason I bring this up is because my mom always referred to sex negatively and I wasn't, didn't have much education. Even in high school, what I learned was very superficial and very abstinent based. So my understanding was if you weren't a virgin, you were on the other end of that spectrum. And I didn't tell anybody, but there was this deep seated shame that I carried around um, around sexuality and the concept of it and what my mom would portray women who weren't virgins as. And I certainly didn't want to tell her about that. So getting back to the date. I remember being picked up, getting in his car and imagining that I was going on this sort of typical date that you would see in a movie or a TV show where you go on a date to a dinner and a movie, but that was definitely not what his expectations of that date were. I remember realizing that he actually had no intention of taking me anywhere other than a dark parking lot to play an uncomfortable game of his version of truth or dare, in which I ended up losing. I blamed myself for being date raped. I didn't report and I didn't disclose to anyone 
because I felt even more shame and guilt and self-loathing. I stuffed it down. And I put it away because I thought telling someone would mean admitting how naive I was, uh, risking being told that I had asked for it, being told that I couldn't have been date raped because I didn't fight him off or I just froze. And I didn't know at the time that consent could be withdrawn. I, I didn't know that consent could be withdrawn. For a while, I even thought that I had actually deserved what had happened. I actually started to dislike myself for letting it happen. And I didn't realize that I had actually started developing some deep-seated self-loathing. Now, cut to my second year of college. I started working part-time at a local restaurant as a bartender. And it was there that I met this guy who waited tables there and who was really cute. And we immediately hit it off. And he was Colombian. I really loved his accent. And he was charming. And all of the girls at the tables that he waited on would flirt with him. And he liked me. I was really in kind of glowing about the fact that he was paying attention to me. Because for those two years between high school and college, I hadn't really liked myself very much. And so here was somebody who was really nice, was really cute, and was paying attention to me. So we started dating and we became sexually active pretty quickly. Um, although I wasn't great. I mean, I just went with it because I thought that was part of being in a relationship. But I also really quickly learned that I was actually a rebound relationship. I wasn't his first choice. I was kind of like, well, since I'm not with somebody and I need someone to stroke my ego, uh, I was that relationship. And in the beginning, it was fun. I didn't really pay much attention to the fact that I was a rebound relationship, but it became very quickly evident that I didn't fit the mold of his past girlfriend. And so I started hearing things like, maybe you should straighten your hair, or um, are you sure you want to wear that? My ex-girlfriend would never wear things like that. Or my ex-girlfriend had really beautiful skin. Maybe you should do something about your acne. Then it started becoming, I don't really want you hanging out with those friends. I don't think they're really good for you. To, um, did you ask if we could go to that party? Uh, like, if you're not going with me, you shouldn't be going by yourself. And very slowly over time, I started feeling bad about myself. I started giving up a lot of my autonomy and independence to him. And I started realizing that uh, my friendships and relationships outside of him were slowly disconnecting. I actually started feeling really negatively about myself and criticized myself for my skin and my hair and the way I dressed. It got so bad that I didn't want to leave my dorm room. I didn't want to go to class. I didn't want people to look at me. And it got so bad that I realized something is wrong. This is not me. I'm not enjoying myself. And I'm definitely not enjoying this relationship anymore. Why? Am I still with him? And why can't I seem to cut it off? I was actually ashamed of telling my friends who had been telling me for weeks to get rid of this guy. So I felt like I couldn't turn to them because they would maybe shame me about my bad decision. So after this period of feeling depressed, this was now about three months into our relationship. 
since I was a psychology major, I decided to seek out the therapist for my school. I figured it was free and maybe this person could give me some sound advice or at the very least maybe give me an antidepressant so I can snap out of my funk and be able to get back to school. So when I went and met with this person, they basically said, this doesn't sound like a very healthy relationship and maybe you should consider ending it with this person since you have told them how you feel, right? And I realized that I hadn't said anything. I had just kept pushing all of these feelings down and looking for ways to just deal with it. But me dealing with it was expressed in depression. And so I went a couple more times and the psychologist managed to convince me to take some action. And I mustered up the courage and I was ready to finally say, okay, I am done with this relationship. We are over. This is it. And I was going to do it in person. And I sent a text message. And I realized in retrospect that I could have done it better, but that was my way of being able to at least do something towards that end. And it didn't go well. I didn't know what to expect, but I definitely didn't realize that it was going to become a much more violent situation than I had anticipated. It turned into psychological abuse of not leaving him to coercion, to uh, sexual coercion, continuing to isolate me from my friends. That became his MO to gain as much control over the relationship as possible. It ended up taking three more months to finally sever ties. In that process, I continued to work in different places, trying to distract myself, trying to find ways to work. And I ended up getting a job at this nightclub in New York City. And one night, I was working at this really long oval bar and there were two bartenders. I was on one end and it was maybe three, four in the morning, close to four in the morning when the bouncer who worked on my end of the counter, so he was watching, you know, everybody and the cash register leans over and he says, um, not to freak you out, but there's a guy that's been here all night watching you. And uh, I just want to make sure that when you leave tonight, you're safe. Now, of course, two things came to mind. First of all, why did you let this person stand there for all night and not tell me until now? But second of all, I thought, is that who I think it is? It was a really busy nightclub and I hadn't paid attention because I was busy working. But when I looked and saw who it was, it was the person who I had been trying to break up with. And what ended up happening was that he believed I was breaking up because I'd been cheating on him and I'd been lying this whole time and made up this whole story about why I wanted to break up, didn't accept any responsibility for it being him, and was stalking me to make sure that I wasn't seeing anybody else. So I asked the bouncer to kick him out, which he did. And I thought, oh, okay, well, at least he's gone now. I closed up my register, went in the back with everybody else, counted our money, counted our tips, and got ready to go out. And as I exited the club and walked over to my car, I see him standing there waiting for me. And I remember the heartbeat pounding in my chest, wondering what he was going to do because at this point, he'd been drinking all night, he was very drunk, and I also found out later very high, and was not letting me get in my car. No one was around, 
and I didn't really know what to do. I managed to yell at him enough for him to get away from my car. I got in, turned on the keys, and right before I was ready to zoom out, he used all of his force and smashed the windshield of my car. So much so that he actually like injured his hand, cut it, but it was enough to freak me out and panic in a way that I had never been jolted before. I had never personally experienced physical violence like that. And I remember thinking, if I had stayed longer, would this have gotten worse? I managed to leave that relationship intact. And it left a mark on me to know that I deserved better and I shouldn't have allowed myself to go that route for so long. I could have taken more action. And at the time, I kind of beat myself up about that, but I realized that those were all lessons on my path to where I am now. Now, years later, five years later to be exact, when I turned 25, after various relationships in between that, where some were not so great and so respectful, others were moving me in the direction of healthier relationships, I found myself in one more relationship, which I realized had an imbalance of power. And the reason why I brought up the point about being a dominatrix is because as I continued to work as a bartender in my college years, I worked at another club in New York City. And on Halloween, I had to find a costume before going to work. And I realized last minute that I didn't have one. And on the way to the club, there was an S&M shop. And I thought, well, I may as well get as original of a costume as possible if I'm gonna dress like a dominatrix. And I picked up some gear, had a mask and a latex dress and a whip. And I'd never acted like a dominatrix or dressed like a dominatrix, but this was full on costume. And I got to the club and immediately realized that my tips doubled that night because if you dress like a dominatrix, people expect you to play the part and apparently dominatrixes are very popular in nightclubs. And so uh, I realized this is kind of a good gig. I'm gonna keep playing this, e you know, this sort of alter ego uh, dominatrix role when I go to work. And so from then on, this sort of alter ego that I called Miss Leah came about. Now I didn't actually use dominatrix uh, aspects of myself outside of work, at least not in the beginning. I enjoyed playing the part because this was something I had never in my life experienced. To actually say what my boundaries were and to have them respected was a completely eye-opening experience. To say when and for a guy to listen and ask me what to do was a completely new experience. And to be honest, I really enjoyed it. I thought I actually get to say what my boundaries are and someone respects them. I actually get to say what and someone says when. Uh, it was amazing. It was a power trip. But one of the most important lessons that I learned through that was that it doesn't have to happen when you wear a costume. We can actually embody these qualities of self-respect and also empowerment in our day-to-day -day lives just in the skin that we already wear. And so this kind of started spilling into my daily life, this concept and idea and these values of honoring my boundaries were spilling into other areas of my life, 
wherever I worked, I would embody Miss Leah. And it wasn't to dictate to others. It wasn't to power trip on them. It was really just to feel empowered and to feel those boundaries being respected was intoxicating because I had never experienced that before. And no one had ever taught me that that was even possible. Now, I stopped being a dominatrix. I don't actually uh, enjoy that in my intimate life. It was merely a costume that I wore, but it taught me so many lessons about consent and boundary setting. And as those aspects of myself developed, they evolved within my relationships. And when I was 25 years old, I got to this one relationship where I really liked this guy. And I thought he really liked me. We kind of had um, a friends with benefits kind of relationship, but the benefits were definitely way more on his side than on mine, because at the time, I didn't know about a thing called orgasm equality. And if you don't know about that, I highly recommend that you look into it, Google it, and learn more about it. But at the time, I really didn't understand that sexual relationships can be equitable and should be equitable, that both partners' pleasures should be centered. And because I liked this person and I really wanted them to like me, I was in this relationship that I thought was equitable until I learned better, but it also was just not satisfying in any way, shape, or form anymore. And I realized that I didn't want to be in this relationship anymore. And I was just giving over my power because I really liked him and hoped that if I did that, he would like me. But it turned into something where in order for us to be together, we were always drunk. And I didn't want to do that anymore. He would always come over with one too many drinks already. And one night I decided I was going to stay sober and I was going to see if I really wanted to keep doing this. And midway through some sexual activity, I decided that I was done. I was not enjoying this. Why did I need to continue? And so I stopped and I said, we're done. I'm not enjoying this and I don't wanna do this anymore. And in his very kind of drunken state, uh, he said, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, I don't wanna do this anymore. I don't enjoy it and I'd like you to leave. And I almost couldn't believe the words coming out of my mouth. I was saying no in the middle of something that I would have normally said, well, I may as well finish, I guess. And he couldn't believe it. And being drunk kept trying to push. And the old me would have maybe given in to that coercion and that continuous pushing and manipulation. And there was this sense from him that all he had to do was try to seduce me or to try to keep pushing and eventually I'd give in. And I stood my ground. It was one of the most empowering moments of my life. And I said no. And I made him leave at two in the morning. And when I saw him leave in his motorcycle as he left, I stood there in awe of myself. And I was very happy at the fact that I could set such a boundary and have it respected regardless of what he said or did. And I made a decision that day that I would never allow myself to be less valuable in a relationship. Two years later, I met my life partner 
and have continued to enjoy a very equitable relationship in which I learned about my own self-worth through the process. Now, the reason why this is so relevant to domestic violence is because we accept domestic violence if that has been what we've accepted in our prior relationships. And for many, particularly those with trauma, we accept it because we believe that that is what we are worthy of. I grew up seeing my mother psychologically and verbally abused. There was never any physical violence in my home, but I witnessed her accepting of being talked down to and belittled. And I thought, I guess that's what relationships are like. And having experienced my own abuse on various levels throughout my childhood and adolescence, and even into adulthood, I thought, I am not worthy of love and respect. Love and respect are things that we are innately worthy of, but society and culture tells women that, and let me rephrase that, tells people, because really it is genderless, that if you are abused, if you are a survivor, if you have experienced assault, it could be your fault. And if it was your fault, then you're worth less. You're damaged or stained or broken. And I want to challenge that on as deep of a level as possible because we are inherently worthy of love and respect, regardless of our sexual history, of our trauma, we are worthy. And there should be no shame upon anyone who has experienced abuse, assault, or trauma. The only person who should ever carry the shame is the abuser. And I know that you may have heard this before and it may sound a little bit like a Hallmark card, but it is the truth. We are conditioned in society to believe in what is known as the Madonna whore construct. And this concept, this very antiquated concept, is at the root of rape culture, something that we consistently and currently live in. This is why the Me Too movement has sprung and sprouted and grown and continues to evolve. And it is why I make it a point to talk about how our past traumas, particularly in childhood, can affect the way that we view ourselves, the way that we see our value, the way that we believe that we are supposed to not accept love and respect, that we aren't worthy of it, but in fact we are. And so it is so important for people to hear stories and know that if someone you know, or if you yourself have ever been in that position where you don't believe you are worthy of better, that it's important to step into our healing journeys, to seek the support and the community and the people that can help us tap into our power, to reclaim our power, to reclaim our sexuality. It is an integral part of our humanity. And we derive a lot of our value from it because of what culture says. But I want to challenge you today to realize that our value is inherently there from the moment we are born and nothing can change that. So I encourage you, if you have gone through this, 
If you have any of those kinds of experiences, whether in childhood or adolescence or yesterday, to seek support, to lean in to community. Now more than ever during this pandemic, our mental wellness needs to be prioritized. We need to heal old wounds, even if we believe we may have already put things in the past. How is it affecting the way that you view yourself, the way that you see yourself worthy of love and respect? And how is that impacting all of your relationships, not just the romantic ones, but all of your friends and family relationships? Are you setting boundaries to honor yourself? And are those in your life honoring those boundaries? I challenge you today to step into your healing. Even if you think it wasn't that bad, for a long time, I didn't speak up about my own child sexual abuse because in comparison to my sisters, who's went on for years, I thought mine couldn't have been as bad. So why would I need to open that up again? But what I came to realize is that it did have a tremendous impact on me. And I am so grateful that I sought out the resources that I needed to seek out to get that help and to learn that I was worthy of healing. And so I challenge you today to the same, to seek out that support, to seek out the healing that you need, to seek out the community and lean into it because you are worthy of love and respect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalia, for sharing all of those intimate stories with us, very powerful. Um, so I get the opportunity to take the last couple minutes of our presentation today and open it up for questions. Um, so there is a Q&A section um, on your screen that you can type in um, a question that you may have and I'm able to field them for you. I do have a couple to start off with. So the first one that we have um, states, I want to support my friends and family. What are some warning signs that a friend might be in an abusive relationship? And how might this look different during the pandemic? And if I see warning signs, what can I do? <laughs> Sorry, I just realized <laughs> I, had, I was muted. Um, so there are uh, many signs similar to the ones that I had um, talked about when I was in university where uh, there was a lot of self-isolation. Um, so if you notice that someone is communicating a lot less often, um, maybe not you know, uh, communicating through the regular platforms that they're on, so if that's social media or text messaging um, or phone calls, if that has been reduced greatly, um, then that's usually an indication that that person is isolating for a reason. Um, so finding ways to check in with that person, if you can't directly, maybe checking in with that person's friends and gathering some information that would help to uh, find out if someone else has been in contact with them, what, you know, what's going on. Um, finding time to make it a point and, and messaging them, emailing, calling, letting them know that you are a support system if they need anything. Um, sometimes people isolate because they believe that others don't care. And if they are getting that continuous support from family and friends um, to, that are seeking out uh, with you know, messages of support, um, a lot of times it can just be messages of, hey, I just wanted to wish you a wonderful day. I love you. I'm thinking of you. Uh, let me know when we can connect for coffee. If they're not responsive um, and it's continuous, then it's something where I would want to intervene personally, physically in person and go and check in on them. Um, but a lot of times if you are connecting, if it's a lot of people that are connecting with them, um, they start to see that there is there is a community of people that care about them and they may uh, lean into that and look out for support or you can recommend other resources for them. You know, so if you've been reaching out and they aren't reaching back, 
then sending them information um, so that they have access to it of other ways that they can find support. Um, sometimes they may be embarrassed to talk to someone. And so if they have other resources, that can be other ways for them to reach out as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, the next question is, you mentioned that you associated your sexual desirability with your worth. How were you able to unravel the connection to your traumatic, traumatic history, your consent experiences and the cycle you went through and separate it all to build your self-worth and your self-esteem? Yeah, so for me, um, I was very, you know, I've always looked for uh, counseling or help. So for me, I'm the type of person that needs to uh, like talk about it. And sometimes I feel like, you know, I need that neutral party. So I've always been very much an advocate of therapy. Um, I've always been an advocate of um, finding community that can um, help you talk those things out. So sometimes if it's not necessarily a therapist, it can be a group um, where that's, you know, they talk about those kinds of issues. For me, I am a voracious reader. So looking at information um, through podcasts or through uh, audiobooks or reading books themselves, um, things that I've found through recommendations from people like therapists or from community that have said, you know, this really helped me and this is how, uh, how it helped me and to talk about that. Um, I found really powerful resources in that way that really helped me to start to think about things differently um, because I didn't grow up with a lot of information. And so anytime that I could get my hands on something that would really help me expand my thinking and expand my, my uh, perspective on something, uh, I really gravitated to that. And there are so many um, resources available today, so many amazing books and authors who are out there advocating uh, for, you know, giving people tools also, you know, so a lot of times in those books, you can find tools that really help you to exercise those things in real life. Sometimes it's just a matter of finding ways to set boundaries within your friendships and testing those little things out. It takes time and it is definitely a process. It's not going to happen in a week. It's not going to happen maybe even in a year, but those things can quickly evolve based on, you know, what kind of action you take. And even if it's a small action, it can have ripple effects and you start to gain confidence in yourself the more that you take that action. So the more that you you do something and you see a positive result, the more that you want to take that next step um, and and in, it's encouraging to see the fact that you can make a change, even if it's a small change, um, and you start to evolve with that change. So that that's what I would recommend. I love that. Make a small change and keep building on that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, the next question is, what is one thing that participants could do today to help make a difference in our families and our communities? So I am a big proponent of sparking conversations. Um, a lot of times we are afraid to be considered like the black sheep of our family. If we bring up a conversation, if we talk about something that's considered taboo. Um, but I challenge people all the time to be some kind of change maker in their family because it will help them to potentially break uh, a, a terrible intergenerational cycle. You know, sometimes we get stuck in these cycles inside of our families or within our friendships and relationships, and we're afraid to be the one that stirs things up. Um, but when we do that, we are change makers. And I consider myself one because I almost enjoy being the one to um, spark up a conversation that maybe people are a little bit afraid of talking about. Um, the more that we can talk about it, the more that we can have a conversation. Sometimes it's just a matter of finding an article about something that we uh, find interesting and agree with that pushes the bar a little bit on, on a topic and we send it to, to a friend or a family member and say, hey, you know, I read this and I thought this about it. What do you think about it? And that sparks conversation. Sometimes it's a matter of, I checked out this documentary. I really think you would like it. 
Um, I know that you might not agree with some of it, but would you be open to watching it and talking about it? Maybe we can have coffee about it the next day. Um, little things like that can have huge impacts more than we realize. And so I always recommend if you can't just like spark up the conversation on your own, sometimes using media to help you have that conversation or to send someone a podcast and say, you know, this really shifted the way I think about this. And I think it would really uh, be eye opening for you and send it off to them is another way that we can utilize these tools to spread new ideas and open up these conversations so that we can start creating change within the, you know, our family uh, dynamic and our relationships. All right. Well, whoo. Thank you so much, Rosalia. Um, this presentation has been deeply moving and insightful. Um, and I truly hope that for all of our participants here today that each and every one of you are taking something. When Rosalia says uh, we are change makers, we can be change makers. Um, I just wanna thank you, Rosalia, for the change that you have made in me today. And, thank you. <laughs> Um, and I hope that each and every one of us um, takes something away that we are different, um, having, having heard you, having engaged today, um, and we're going to be able to then go on to spark those conversations and be the change for our own circles of influence. So thank you so much um, for inspiring us um, to this work that we are called to do. Um, and when each of us makes that one individual effort, those efforts combine. Um, and then we can impact our families, we can impact our communities, even though we can be overwhelmed, feeling like we are powerless, it is not true. Um, we make those ripple effects each and every day with how we show up to one another. Um, and that is what our stick we can <laughs> and this effort on campus around prevention is truly about. So thank you so much again, Rosalia, um, for modeling that for us today. Thank you. So thank you uh, participants, um, all the folks who have attended today. Um, we will be sending out a brief um, survey just to hear your thoughts, what you're, again, you know, hear from you all, um, how you were changed, if you were changed today, what you're taking away, um, as well as what you'd like to see from future programming. Um, so please take um, a few minutes to respond when you receive that survey um, and stay in touch with us. Um, I have put, Rosalia's um, platforms in the chat um, a few minutes ago. Um, I also kind of pulled out some um, main, uh, you know, points that that were brought up in the Q&A that Rosalia spoke to for us to take away. And I've just shared the um, stick domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault and stalking COVID-19 resources webpage in the chat for um, extensive resources that are at your fingertips um, here in the on campus and in the community. And please stay in touch. Um, so I'm gonna, I just got prompted. I wanna share something. Um, thank you. So a comment um, from the Q&A. Thank you for your story. I, and I feel your worth. It is a million. Thank you again. <laughs> Rosalia just put her hands together to say thank, thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Um, so stay in touch, um, take away my contact. Um, you can also be in touch with the collaborators and partners who are part of this event today. And we're just gonna keep on connecting with the campus, amplifying and expanding our work and building this community together where each and every one of us and our efforts combined, we can make a difference together here at STIC. So thank you all and we'll see you soon. <laughs>